When unwanted aquatic species enter Wyoming waterways, it's a serious problem, and the Wyoming Game and Fish Department has to get involved. We'll speak with Wyoming Game and Fish Fisheries Supervisor, Bobby Compton. I'm Steve Peck of Wyoming PBS, and this is Wyoming Chronicle. Funding for this program is made possible in part by the Wyoming Humanities Council, helping Wyoming take a closer look at life through the humanities, thinkwhy.org, and by the members of the Wyoming PBS Foundation. Thank you for your support. We're here in the Wyoming Chronicle with Bobby Compton of Wyoming Game and Fish Department. Bobby, uh, tell us what your title is exactly. Sure, I'm the Laramie Region Fisheries Supervisor. Fisheries Supervisor, and that's gonna figure into what we're talking about primarily today. We're here at Saratoga Lake, just outside the town of Saratoga. The issue of invasive water species around Wyoming crops up from time to time. It cropped up here at Saratoga Lake recently. You're telling me off camera, it's not the first time it's happened here. Something particular about certain places makes it more likely to happen. Tell us what uh, went on here over the past year or two that became alarming to you and to the department. So in 2021, um, we had a graduate student at the University of Wyoming. Really? He was doing some, some survey work and um, he was collecting smaller fish, so he had some traps out. And he gave us a phone call and said, I think I found some small perch. So he found some, some yellow perch. They were born in 2021. They were two or three inches. Um, once we got a hold of them and verified they were indeed yellow perch, that kind of raised the alarm because we've never stocked yellow perch in, in, the, in Saratoga Lake, nor do we have them anywhere in the watershed within the Platte Valley. Um, the closest we have in the North Platte drainage with yellow perch is uh, Glendo Reservoir, so pretty far downstream. And so that, um, once we could verify they were yellow perch, um, that's when we had conversations on what to do with them. Um, again, yellow perch, not invasive. Um, we have some species in Wyoming that are listed invasive, and those are the quagga and zebra mussels and, and animals we're really trying to keep outside of Wyoming. Um, What's the word you'd use for I'd it call when it they just, show up here? What I would call it just unwanted um, uh, and illegally brought in. Yeah. The, the point you made is that yellow perch is a fish that does exist harmoniously in other parts of Wyoming, but it's not supposed to be here. Why is that such a big deal? Yeah, you're correct. You know, we do manage for yellow perch as a sport fish. Uh, appreciate their value. Anglers love them. Probably why, you know, they were brought in here. Somebody wanted to catch a yellow perch and not a trout. Um, yellow perch have a role and in the in the food chain, in the food web, in many lakes. We were afraid here in Saratoga Lake that it would disrupt um, kind of the food chain. Um, and that's one of the reasons that we, we acted. Um, I could explain that in a little bit, but so there was going to be some direct impacts to the fishery here at Saratoga Lake with yellow perch, but um, kind of on the watershed scale, we knew they would likely um, escape from Saratoga Lake. So Saratoga Lake is connected to the North Platte River. The North Platte flows into it, Correct. flows back out from yeah. it, so, and that's how the fish can right. get out, and that's, that would be an even worse problem. Yes. In the yeah. larger frame of things. Yeah. So in, in the North Platte River starts in Colorado, travels north, water comes in and out near Saratoga, but you know, not too far downstream, you run into Seminole Reservoir, the Medicine Bow River, and then down to Pathfinder, Alcova, Gray Reef, and so it almost posed as a as a headwater source for 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 perch that could escape and end up in all these other waters, including the rivers. And, and uh, we just thought that was too big of a threat um, to, to live with them, you know, moving on and, and, and expanding in those reservoirs. When you say it would impact the fishery. The fishery that you want in Saratoga Lake is trout, right? Correct. What would the perch do to the trout? Would they just outcompete them? Would they attack them? What's the issue when they exist in the same body of water? Primarily, it would be competition for food. Um, you know, perch are not as predaceous as, say, walleye or um, even a brown trout, for example. 
but um, they can be prolific. That's the other kind of life history strategy with perch is, is females lay a lot of eggs. They're very fecund. And so in, in a short amount of time, you know, three to five years, they can really expand to, to numbers that are um, amazing, really. And They're so- They're more fruitful and multiply faster than the trout do. Absolutely, yeah. Actually, trout don't even reproduce in a lake like this. That's, we get, you know, a fishery by stocking. But, you know, we have examples in other parts of the state, uh, two come in mind in the Sheridan region where perch got in, one is, uh, Black Hills Power and Light near Newcastle, another one, Healy Reservoir, just east of Buffalo. And in, in both cases, uh, the trout fisheries were abandoned, you know, in a short amount of time, just mainly because there were so many small perch. So once you have a lot of perch, they pretty much eat all the food. So there's not food for trout. So we don't see any growth in the trout, but the perch also don't grow. So then you end up with a lot of stunted two to five inch trout. And I just say like, in general, if you or I were gonna go out and, you know, harvest some fish you for want a, a meal, trout bigger than that. And you want a perch bigger than that too. You know, you might want a seven, eight inch perch, you know, that gives you enough food to eat. So in those cases, those lakes are so full of, of small fish that really there's, there's not much of a fishery at all. And so they, you know, we walk away from them. What is the story of Saratoga Lake? It's a, it's a man-made lake that's been here for half a century or so. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think it was it was built in the 40s. It doesn't serve any true irrigation like many other reservoirs in the state. It's here for recreation. Primarily for recreation. You know, it's it's a unique situation in that the Wyoming Game and Fish Department manages the public access, the fishing, waterfowl hunting, and some wetland habitat below, but it's owned, a uh, portion of it's owned by the town of Saratoga, and they really, um, there's a campground, and it's a great place, you know, for tourists to come in and spend a, a weekend either going into Saratoga or passing through, so it brings a lot of money into the town, the campground does, and when the fishery is operating at a high capacity and it's drawing in anglers, we know that that also brings in a lot of income to the town of Saratoga. So again, just to, to reiterate, when the fishery is operating at high capacity the way you want it to, that means I could stand here on the shore or maybe go out in my boat and cast a line and reel in a decent sized trout. That's what, Correct. that's the desirable outcome. Correct, and you know, uh, Saratoga is at 7,000 feet. You know, it's a cold environment. It's ideal for trout, not only Saratoga Lake, but the river, the right. North Platte River, the Encampment River. It's one of the, the premier wild trout fisheries in Wyoming or the West between. And so that's another reason we're trying to protect what we have in the river um, with these perch. But yeah, the Saratoga Lake, when it's, when it's um, doing well, we experience really high growth rates and it's a phenomenal trout fishery too. What's the difference then between a lake where you'd see perch but wouldn't care as much and this one is because the lake is bigger or deeper or different temperature why would you yeah. and we're going to talk about what you had to do decided had to be done to restore the trout fishery here in a lake where you didn't take action what would be some of the differences i'll just use boysen reservoir as an example you, you know boysen close to your home it's a large reservoir it's deep um, it also has a better food base um, for fish like walleye, you know, which is, you know, a lot of people travel to Boysen to fish for walleye. So, you know, it kind of has uh, the tiers you want to support perch. So perch in Boysen, you could fish for, you know, they grow to nice sizes. They're typically not too prolific because the walleye can keep them down. But um, outside of walleye eating perch, you know, there's a lot of minnows for forage and there's just a better food base to support those kind of top level um, predators. Here in Saratoga Lake, it's pretty simple. Um, it's driven by aquatic insects. So scuds and damselflies and those sort of things that trout really like. There's also zooplankton that trout will eat. Um, but as far as what can support perch and then even the next kind of little predator, we don't have that here. It's shallow. Um, How deep, but it's deep. Uh, max, max depth would be about 20, but on average it's about 
six to eight feet. Yeah. And again, that kind of matches up to some of those waters shared in these, sh these shallow waters where um, it didn't really produce, you know, a, a perch fishery that, that people would want to go there to fish for. Yeah. So there are different lakes, different fish, different unwanted fish in a different place. And this is something that Game and Fish, in this case, in cooperation, as you said, with a, with a municipality, is called upon to deal with in some different ways. Um, we knew we had a problem, and uh, there's many examples of this happening in other places. We talked earlier, whether it's you know Lake Trout in Yellowstone or Walleye in Buffalo Bill, Burbot in Flaming Gorge. Um, heck, we've had smallmouth bass and Sloans, and it, it happens a lot, but here we just thought um, we could catch it in time, so we could maybe eradicate the perch before they proliferated, but it's a, it was a small enough system where um, you could have a project with some chance of success. And when you, so the, the thing that was decided in this case, and it's not possible to do in other cases and wouldn't be desirable to try, but when you say eradicate, the thing you did was essentially, let's use the word, you killed all the fish in the lake, essentially, and restocked only with the ones that were desirable, including some others. Am I no, you're halfway right. right there? You're right, and likely the hardest thing I'll ever do in my career. I don't want to do that a ton. You're a fisheries guy. I'm yeah. a fisheries guy. I love fish, and um, it's hard to make those decisions. But, you know, um, from our chief of fisheries, our director, um, we decided that we wanted to act and, and act immediately and not wait any longer because we have examples of when we didn't, of what the results yeah. are. So what typically would take three to five years to plan, um, and there's a lot that went into it, whether it's finding the money, um, reaching out to the, the local community, the homeowners, um, it was very complicated, um, but we were able to do it in a year. Um, the, the fisheries biologist, Chance Kirking, the spearhead of the project, um, went above and beyond. And again, nothing that we like to do, but something we felt like we needed to do. You found, as it turned out, or you knew and realized maybe even to a bigger extent, there were other fish besides the perch that were causing a problem here, and they needed to be dealt with also. Another reason why we decided to do it is that um, because Saratoga Lake is, is connected to the North Platte River, again, water in, water out, the fish in the North Platte River can come in here too. So um, it was actually treated in 1998. So a similar project using rote known in 1998. At that time, we did it just to suppress the white suckers. White suckers. Yeah. So white suckers are native to the North Platte River. Um, and we actually um, conserve them, uh, protect them in other places in their natural habitats. But when they get in impoundments, they can, um, much like perch, just artificially expand to levels that are you would never see in natural habitat. And so what that happened here, um, they were very prolific. We watched that expansion through the years. And so when we, we knew once, you know, we treated the lake with rote known, those white suckers would go away, that that would again free up food that the that you know trout compete with um, the other thing too is that there's brook stickleback in the valley they also got in they're actually an invasive species so a listed species they were in the lake at high numbers and um, another reason why we treat in fact the blm bureau of land management out of rollins their aquatic folks um, they helped out a lot on this project because they wanted to try to eliminate a source um, of that AIS that is spreading through the valley too. So here you have a municipality involved, a state agency involved, a uh, federal agency involved. Yes. You come together as needed to help each other solve a problem as you, as you find it. And here's an example of it. And this happens in different ways around Wyoming. You use the, you mentioned the product rotenone, sure. and it's a poison, correct? I don't call it a poison as in it's toxic. So. Um, rotenone is actually derived from a root um, from the, uh, a plant in the bean, flam, bean family in South America. And so when we get it as product, you know, in a barrel, it's uh, ground. It's just pure ground rotenone root. Um, it, you know, it's a pretty high concentrate. What we get it at and what we apply it at is, is two different things. So we apply it at a really low level 
in a very precise level. But um, why I wouldn't say it's a poison is it doesn't kill a fish or harm um, you know, birds, others, by ingesting what it does is um, it doesn't allow the fish to take up oxygen. Okay, so any gilled animal, fish being one of them, uh, they can't take up oxygen and that's how they end up dying. Um, but once that leaves the system, usually takes a week or two for it to kind of precipitate out, you know, it's gone. It's gone from it's the gone. water. It's gone, it's gone from the water. Especially in the, the flow through that you have here uh, enhances that or might maybe accelerates it a little bit too, I would, would guess. Yeah. So the fish die and this included the trout that Yes. That still were here. I, I presume the procedure then is the dead fish need to be removed from the water. Yes. How many fish were we talking about in this case? Yeah, so here, like you said, we didn't really know uh, what we were going to see. You always think you know what you have until uh, you end up, you know, being able to see every fish you've got. Um, we, again, we didn't count them, but we estimated to pick up about 10,000 dead fish. Again, an effort that I don't ever want to do again. That was that was really hard, hard on all of our crew. We worked really hard with it, but we got about 70% white suckers, about 10% perch and about 20% trout. So we did kill a lot of trout, really beautiful trout. And uh, that was that was no good. It was no good killing any of those. Yeah, fish. it's too bad. I, I hear what you're saying about that because your job is protecting fish, but in the larger sense, People who know what they're doing have experienced this before. People of game fish and, and science understood that this was the best chance to, to control the issue here in this relatively closed small body of water. There's an opportunity to do it. What happens to all those dead fish? In this case, we just, we, um, we, we, we buried them. Yeah, we buried them. There's some cases I think I've read about where if there's a fish die off for whatever reason, sometimes they can be put to some other purpose, but that's not what this was about. Um, Correct. So then, the this lake's essentially sitting here without any fish in it. How do you put them back in? First off, we want to make sure the rotenone's out of the system. And it's actually a pretty simple way in that we use what we call canary fish. So we'll immediately start putting fish in cages in the water. It's kind of like a bioassay. And, you know, if a fish gets sick or dies, there's still, you know, a toxic level of rotenone. But after about two or three weeks here, um, fish were surviving. We were using trout. Um, they were surviving, so we knew the rotenone was out. And um, we also did a ton of netting. So we had a lot of gill nets all through fall just to confirm that we, you know, didn't have any fish left. So that happened. Um, Actually, the, the lake stayed fishless all winter, and then starting in spring after we got a fish screen in to um, stop white suckers and brook stickleback from coming back, uh, we wanted to start bringing water back in and fish back in. So we turned on the water and then we started stocking trout in the spring. I would say stocking trout. There's a, a fish hatchery near Saratoga. Yes. Is that where you went for these? Yeah, you know, it's a unique situation in that we typically don't use a lot of fish from the Saratoga National Fish Hatchery. You know, they have different obligations, whether they're um, raising fish for the uh, Wind River Indian Reservations or, or fisheries around the, the U.S. for that matter. We typically stock fish from Wyoming Game Fish Department hatcheries, but in this case, they did have some really, really nice uh, rainbow trout. Um, the community felt strongly about using, you know, or receiving fish. Really? from you know their local hatchery so it worked out in that we stocked about 12,000 near catchable rainbow trout from Saratoga fish hatchery. How big is near they're, catchable? Yeah they're, they were eight to nine inches when this lake does not have suckers and you know the the bugs are back we could expect fish to grow you know four to eight inches in a year it's really really phenomenal growth. So they come over in a how are they transported from the hatchery to here in a, so. a hatchery truck yeah. with that has a you know an aerated tank. I think I've seen this. You there's a big hose sort yeah. of, and you just yep. Actually, here form. you know they just back up really to the boat ramp because and, there's strong flow through inflow from the river. Yeah, it's just that you get enough depth, and you could just stock the fish right into the lake. They want to swim. Yeah, once they swim away. Once they get in there. Now that must be fun to do. It's fun. It was wonderful to see these fish back. In, a, in addition to the rainbow trout, uh, we stocked some tiger trout. 
That's a um, sterile cross between a brook and a brown trout. Why put them there? Um, we, so we did them and brown trout. The reason we put those two fish in, a couple reasons. One of the reasons, and we've been surveying and talking to the anglers here for years, one of the complaints, if there was one, was there was not enough variety of, of fish. You know, and that, it appears that, you know, yellow perch were, were one they wanted, but we heard that loud and clear. We just knew we couldn't stock other non-trout, um, but so to get a little more variety, we now are stocking tiger trout, brown trout, rainbow trout. The other reason we did the, the tigers and the browns was they're more predacious, so more willing to, you know, um, eat fish. And the, the thought is, is if those white suckers or brook stickleback end up in the in the lake again, we want to have those those predators, the the brown trout and the tiger trout, big enough to you know to feed on the, the few. Um, you know, white suckers or stickleback if they get in here. And, and provide a variety. Yeah, these uh, pred predatory trout don't eat other trout. Is that what you're trying They will eat other trout. It's just that we stock the trout just like those Saratoga National Fish Hatcheries. If they're stocked at, you know, five to eight inches, they're too big to be consumed. So um, you can still have both. How do we think this happened to Saratoga Lake? How specific is the knowledge of why the perch got here. You know, we can't say for certain how, but it's highly likely that, you know, somebody took it upon themselves to, you know, catch them in another spot, transport them, and then release them. And so that's they go, So people would go to the trouble of yeah. catching a fish and keeping it live in a cooler or something and bringing it here just to establish them here so that what they could Correct. fish for those. Yes. Now we, we spent the whole summer trying to figure out if that happened. So, you know, we started by just talking to our neighbors, our, you know, our, our colleagues in Colorado with Parks and Wildlife. We wanted to know, have they ever, do they have fish in, in the upper headwaters of the North Platte? Have they stocked them? Have they ever permitted private fish stocking? Have they ever seen any, you know? And the answer was no. We don't believe there's any perch above, you know, upstream of Wyoming. Then we spent a lot of the summer sampling the river, seeing like, Maybe they're already established in the river and they came in, or if they've already escaped and there was a, a population established from here. So after we did all that, we also reached out to Saratoga National Fish. Have you ever had them? No, they haven't. And then finally, you know, the, then it's like, well, maybe, you know, people would say that we stocked them and maybe they were in a load of trout, but we've never had perch, you know, on any station, any hatchery in Wyoming. We're pretty careful about that. Yeah, we don't stock yellow perch. We, cool and warm our fish we get, Steve, we get from other states. So we trade trout. I think we stocked maybe 1.4 million uh, walleye and other species last year. Those all came from out of state. So they don't mix at all, you know, with, with our trout and our hatcheries. What if you had been able to determine uh, down to an individual or a few who had done this thing that we talked about, deliberately caught the perch elsewhere, come here to release them. That's a crime, isn't it? It's a, yeah, it's a serious crime. In fact, um, I think within the last 10 years or so, we've changed, you know, some statute to increase the penalties for illegal introductions. Our uh, legislature have been very supportive of that. In fact, I think we have some of the toughest laws in the West. And so, I mean, we, we spent $140,000 last year doing this. Um, that's an expensive act, or, you know. Uh, Which was sort of off budget, right? I mean, it wasn't. Very off budget. Yeah, you weren't counting on having to do that. What, we're here in the first day of August as it happens. What's the status of the lake now? Are there, what fish are there today? Yeah, so right now we have the rainbow, rainbow trout, tiger trout, and brown trout. So they're all here. There's always, there's no closed fishing season in Wyoming, except this was clearly was closed for fishing for a while. Is it open now? It's open to fishing now, yeah. And you know, another thing that goes on here in Saratoga is uh, a very popular and renowned ice fishing derby. It would have been the 40th year last year and they actually had to cancel another, um, you know, unfortunate uh, problem with the, but it will be back this year. Um, I think the fish will be of size and, and I think it'll be really fun. I know, again, thank the, the town for being patient with us. And I know they lost a lot of money um, last year with that, but um, we're, we're getting there. Um, you talked about the 
the cooperation, and we mentioned clear down, and, and Saratoga is a small town of about less than 2,000 people, and you have the state agency, and then you have the federal agency. What I found is, I think, and see if you agree with this, that wildlife and fisheries and is something where people of all kinds of different um, ideologies, we might say, can come together and find a common ground, and that must have, that pretty much had to happen here. It did happen here, and we were pleasantly surprised, but after working with our partners and, and the community, realized just a lot of good people that understood and trusted us in what we were trying to do and supported, and uh, it was that was just one part of the project that was unexpected and was just really rewarding is to work with everyone and, and including, you know, the private landowners course, that surrounded the sure. lake. Um, and you had people who normally would be very, very protective of uh, something that humans would do to cause a mass die off of fish if it were a chemical spill or something like that. Absolutely. But in this case, you found that Game and Fish was trusted. The situation was explained and made a harder problem a little bit easier at least. Yeah, and even the people that um, maybe didn't agree with why we were doing it, they were at least open to the reason for doing it and, and you know, just... You could understand. They understood. They were yes. heard. They were, yep. And they at least yeah. could... And could this be. is one of those situations where we actually um, knew we were going to do it. We had directive from our director and our chief of fisheries, so we weren't actually able to ask if people wanted us to do it or not. We knew we had to do it, but I feel like we did a pretty good job of explaining why, how it was gonna go, and then what the result was gonna be at the end, and I think that's um, where everybody came together and, and really worked towards that goal. Okay.